Welcome to Have You Heard, where we talk about issues at the intersection of agriculture and engineering. Let's get started. Here are your hosts, Morgan Hayes and Josh Jackson. Um, this is the Have You Heard podcast. This is episode 28. We're going to talk a little bit today about our choices for our spring breeding, uh, our natural service versus uh, artificial insemination. Um, but before we get started here, I'm Morgan Hayes. I'm an assistant professor in biosystems and ag engineering at the University mm-hmm. of Kentucky. Uh, and in my personal life, I farm in Boyle County, Kentucky with my husband. We farm around 500 acres. It's a commercial cattle and hay operation. Now I'm Josh Jackson, assistant professor in biosystems and agriculture engineering as well. And I farm in Mercer County where we raise registered Angus cattle and also focus on some hay production. And today we are going to talk a little bit about our spring breeding, really discuss in a little bit more detail our decision making on using natural service versus AI um, and whether or not we have any strong feelings about it, I guess. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what's been happening on the farm this week because it has been pretty busy, at least on our farm. Uh, So let's see, this past week uh, we did some custom cutting for uh, a neighbor of some hay and then we also worked on uh, some bush hogging so we've been seeing some pink eye issues at least for our spring group and then uh you know we also got some ear tags and you know the funny thing is we put the ear tags in our, our spring group and i think i mentioned that last time and they they didn't have a, a chemical smell to them but the fly it seems to be a lot of flies on their face so i gotta investigate and figure out uh what's going on with that I think maybe you have some defective ear tags. It could be, you know, so that's something you got to think. We, we, and we switch chemicals. So I know there's, we mentioned, again, there's a couple of chemicals. Uh, we switch chemicals. So we got to see what the issue is because, I don't know, they have they have a fair number of flies on their face for just being put in. Brand new tag. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. We, and, the, and the flies have been significantly heavier in the last week or two. I, I've noticed that as well. So probably a little bit of both maybe the ear tags not doing their job and also just a heavier population. And our, our fall group, we haven't actually tagged yet. I put the fly tags in, but they seem to be doing, we put them on, rotate them to a new pasture. That's something else we did this weekend. Took a little bit of time trying to chase down a, a short gremlin somewhere. <laughs> it was, I think it turned out it's just like a, a lot of weed pressure, but we were kind of just ah, we're ignoring that and for other bigger faults. But it ended up that the weed weed pressure was probably was still getting. the major issue, and, and so uh, yeah, just just getting animals moved around, um, trying to get ready for the next cutting of hay. I think we got one more cutting of hay we can knock out here, and then we'll pretty much be done for our first cutting. How about you, Morgan? Yeah, so we cut hay. Um, <clears throat> I know we talked about this a little bit about whether that window was going to open up, but my husband ended up cutting on Thursday, which was in theory a day it was supposed to rain. Uh, we got minimal rain out of that. Uh, front that came through that day so we did get it cut um and we got it bailed saturday which was a surprise i was yeah. thinking it looked like it was going to be a cooler weekend but dry uh if you uh read the forecast from from matt he <laughs> did tell us that it was going to be good drying weather and it, it absolutely was it was windy and uh very dry from a dew point standpoint which was really nice uh, for drying weather. Plus it's also very pleasant to bale hay when it's not a hundred degrees outside. So oh, yeah. in many ways, it was a very pleasant <laughs> week for doing hay. Um, we had 40 acres, so we had a pretty good amount of hay down. Um, so that was a really great positive. We got it down, baled and up on Sunday into the barn. So that was good. We've had two major breakdowns this week. Um, one is a tractor and one is a truck. It's our secondary farm truck. It's not our primary vehicle, but that makes hauling hay in a little bit slower. So logistically, it's a little bit trickier. Um, okay, but it is it is something we just have to recognize at this point. And then uh, the tractor uh, lost a uh, clutch. Huh. Uh, it's unclear if it's actually like uh, what it is in there. It might be just that bearing that slip where that clutch slips in and out. Yeah. Um, but. It, until we break the tractor apart, we won't know. Um, it will be a fairly constant sti- on or constant off. It's a constant off now. Oh, okay. It was it was mowing. We had a, about two acres left, and my husband dropped that one tractor and picked up a different tractor to finish cutting the last couple acres. But um, it is now in a constant off state, which is um, 
<laughs> safer, I guess, for the person running the equipment and other things, but also annoying in the sense that the tractor is completely defunct. Yeah. Uh, as part of it, it also, it is a two-stage, um, for anyone who's not familiar, the tractor ETO is what drives equipment in the back. Um, your clutch that you would use, like similar to a car, to change gears it's a two-stage clutch. So you push the clutch all the way down and then halfway back up, and the PTO engages as part of the clutch system. Pretty standard, at least on all old tractors. Some newer yep. tractors have some different styles of clutching and PTO on off, but on older tractors, it's a two-stage clutch and the PTO is part of that two-stage system. So that is uh, what we have on this tractor, uh, or we did have it. <laughs> Hopefully we will again once we get it fixed. Uh, but the PTO is off, and as a result, also our hydraulics are oh, sort of non-operable yeah. because they also sit yep. on that same two-stage clutch. So when PTO turned to an automatic off, sometimes your hydraulics will turn to automatic on, and that just destroys the pump. But fortunately, they also have turned off with the PTO. So all of it is off currently. Uh, it is basically something that we could, I guess we could haul a wagon could, with it at this draft, point. Yeah, it's a draft tractor almost, but yeah. Yeah, it's not useful for very much is what I'm yeah. going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so that one has to be broke. And to, to break into a clutch, you have to break into the main part of the tractor. You actually have to split a tractor to do this. So most likely this is a major fix. It will be down for a few weeks. Um, problematic, yes. Im impossible, no. Um, I was say a few weeks. Uh, that's that's kind of seemed optimistic there. <laughs> we do have a person that we know that is a mechanic. Um, that he could get to it. It'll be about another week from now when he gets to it. Um, I'm, but he only works on one one tractor at a time. So once it goes in, it will it will it will come back out. It's a small. It's not like going to a larger dealer where it might sit sort of halfway broken somewhere on their lot for a month or two. Provided that we can get supplies in to make the replacements, it will be a pretty quick turnaround. We'll need it for second cutting of hay. We still have forty acres or so of first cutting hay to do. We can get by. We do have redundancy on our tractors, but it is a problem not to have this tractor in, in yeah. use. So it is so a priority to get it back before we start into second cutting hay. Was it your baling tractor? Or? It's actually not our baling tractor. It's our mowing tractor, which is about 10 horse lighter than our baling tractor. But it was So our baling, our baling tractor will be used to mow. But well, it's oversized. It's slightly oversized. It just has a little bit more... Uh, power than we need mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're just burning up uh, extra fuel with extra horsepower <laughs> we, right now is not the time when you want to burn <laughs> up extra fuel the the other tractor is just not quite as it's just not quite as comfortable to to drive uh, mowing work at least on our farm is a lot of clutch work just because we use the hay bind oh and yeah. we have to sort of yep. It, it it's just the type of equipment that we run. It it is sort of a cumbersome thing, and this tractor just is more comfortable to run for this type of operation. So it's not the end of the world, but it is it is a problem. They are both problems. Uh, the 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 truck is probably a less of a problem. It's probably a brain issue. We probably got some water in there. It's just an older night early nineties model truck, and sometimes we get some moisture. We park it usually protected from rain and stuff but we've had a couple really big rainstorms with some blowing wind okay in the last month or two and we just we think something happened with some moisture getting in behind that engine okay so not hopefully not not a world ender sounds like no i don't think so the truck has had this issue before so it's this is not a shocking issue so hopefully yep. it's a fairly simple fix on the truck but the the tractor is definitely a significant fix yep definitely unexpected <laughs> uh, of all of our equipment, this is not the one that we thought was going to go out. We did replace a couple bearings on our baler before we went into this round. The baler seems to be doing well. I'm going to knock on wood <laughs> right now because we don't need another <laughs> another piece of equipment down currently. Um, but everything else uh, is going okay, so we're not we're not in terrible shape. We are very lucky that we have some redundancy equipment. Uh, we can make uh, everything work. It's just a little bit, a little bit more work for us. Okay, so like, so when last time we had baled hay, we had like one bearing had went out. And we replaced it. One bearing we knew about, replaced it. Thought we solved the issue. Then another bearing went out. Like the next, like midway through the next day. So oh. that was that was very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes it seemed like it. It seemed like it all happened at once. But the one I think 
where it had been so noisy and it, you knew it was going, it kind of covered up the problems we were having. Without Masking it. the other problems. Yeah. The other thing I will say is that, and this is maybe just an observation, this is not a, a proven fact. There's no, there's no data behind what I'm saying right now at all. But to me, a bailer, when things start to go, you get significant failures at one point. Um, like we replaced all of our chains on our baler a year ago. There was a little bit of wear on one of the chains and a little bit of stretch in it, and we replaced it. And we went ahead and replaced the other chains, just recognizing that if one's wearing and stretching and getting some play, then the other ones start to also have that same some other issues. So you, you almost like you're paying attention to one thing, but when that happens, almost all the other things that are in line with it in the same system also tend to have issues. Yep. Almost back to back. You, sometimes like, you can drag it out so that they're not right on top of each other from paying for the repair standpoint. But I think from a practical standpoint, it's sometimes it's easier just to accept that we're working on this system right now and we're just going to have to replace a bunch of disposable like, parts in that system. Yep, the cascade effect almost. So, but anyway, com coming back, you know, we've gone through the equipment, you know, going back now to talking about the AI versus natural service. Yeah, that was the other thing we did this last week is we did get all of our bulls tested. Okay. Um, so we Everybody are now, passed? everyone passed. We have four bulls. All four bulls are considered good. Uh, our, our smallest <laughs> bull, our one that we used for heifers was a little feisty. My husband says this might be his last hurrah before okay. he leaves the farm because he <clears> was not aggressive with him but he's not afraid of people and uh, just kind of like leans in and doesn't go anywhere uh but he doesn't have any problem pushing someone into a into a fence just to get him out of his way if they're trying to push him into, uh, into the corral so he's he's being a little obstinate if i had to choose the right word for him um right. and he's big enough that you cannot be obstinate it's not acceptable to have an obstinate bull because they are uh large and in charge Yep. So it might be a hamburger time or something, hamburger helper. Or... He he might become hamburger. He <laughs> might he might become ground beef. I mean, we do have a market to sell some ground beef, so that might be where he goes. Honestly, if the bull market is strong enough, he's a very attractive looking bull. And he is he will be consistently he's frame size small enough that he can be a heifer bull and he can last for a long time for someone if they want a heifer bull. Okay. Um personality wise though, he's just not gonna He's not going to last on our farm considering that type of behavior. It's just not right. We have small children and, and old people and, and myself, <laughs> and I'm like highly risk averse. I just, <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't want to get hurt. So there's, we're going to enough stuff that goes wrong. You don't know you somebody actively working against you. So. Uh, and that bull might try. So he's, he's probably on his last, uh, hurrah, but he did successfully pass his exam. So he will be out with the ladies here in a week. Oh, I read about the other three. They they all, all they're all good, and they are all going in with our um, our senior cows. All of our cows are older cows. Do you separate them off into groups? Or you just throw everybody out there and say, "You guys cover the cows, and whatever happens happens." Or uh, you try to keep track of who's who. We we have all three currently going out with the group of cows that we have, um, for a couple reasons. Um, one. Two of the three bulls are genetically extremely similar. Okay. Um, and in theory, those two would be the only bulls going out. Um, but they were both young last fall when they got put in. And the other one is the older bull that we've had. We thought about selling him. One of those younger bulls pulled down in the wintertime. He passed his test. He's, he's a viable bull to use, but he was a little bit sick over the winter. Uh, last year, we had two catastrophic failures out of bulls and so we figure if we have three in we'll get at least something to breed during the season right also two bulls for some reason i don't know if this is true or not i've heard this before that when there's two bulls sometimes there's fighting but when there's three bulls there's less fighting they're not that there's less fighting but they're less likely to knock one off of another cow while mounted causing some of the injuries because all three bulls are sort of circling together. Okay. And I don't know if that's true or not, but a lot of people do run either one bull or three bulls. Hmm. Uh, two bulls is, we see also as a, a system that people run, but those two bulls have to be very comfortable with each other, I think, to run just two bulls. Right. Um, 
I don't know if that's true. I actually have no, I've never seen any data on that to see if that is actually true or if that's just a, a farmer myth. Like wives tale kind of thing. Yeah, it could, it could absolutely be that. Um, but because we had some structural issues last year and some other things, we're just going to go ahead and leave all three bulls in. Right. We oh. certainly don't need three to cover the cows that we have. <laughs> but but uh, to ensure if something does happen, you have you have We have much. adequate supply yeah, in there to, to make sure we have full coverage for all the cows. When, when you plan for your cows, you plan for how much do you plan for each bull to cover? Um, so we typically have, we would want two bulls in with a group of anywhere from 35 to 50 head of cow. Okay. Uh, if we have over 50 head of cow, I would want more than two bulls. In this case, we have three bulls, but our cow herds just sit just under 50. So somewhere in the 40s right now. Okay. I know sometimes we have... Uh... People come to our farm and they want a yearling bull or 18 month old bull and they want to put them on a, a large number of cows. Like well, Generally, we try to suggest to them that, you know, the month and their age and months, we try to say that many cows is what they could cover. Yeah, I think that that's probably accurate up to about 30. I think once yeah, you have about, over, yeah. once you hit about 30 months of age or 30, they can still 30. just cover about 20 or 30, 25. 30. 25 to 30 is about all they can cover. And it also depends on the field they're in. I think that's the other thing that people don't always yep. talk about is that. The bull is only going to follow, if he gets a scent, he's going to follow the cow that he thinks is coming into heat. And if the, if it's in a large 40, 60 acre pasture and there's two in heat on opposite sides, he's never going to pick up the smell of the second one because he's already found one that he's following. Um, and that's why you end up with that longer breeding season. So that's another reason to put in multiple if you're going to do natural service the yep. way that we choose to. Um, the the counter argument sort of that you already made is that when you go with natural service and you put multiple bulls in with one large group of animals is that you don't know which one is the father because we have a commercial herd and we're not selling bulls or heifers as single breeding animals or, breeding animal we might like sell a bred sell. heifer but we're we're selling a commercial bred heifer we're not selling a pure blood genetic epd we were not going to be able to provide any of that information anyway it's far less relevant to us to have it okay um so we accept that when we have multiple bulls in there that we don't know which one is but we're pretty intentional about trying to keep genetics similar so that we get similar growth out of the calves okay so if we buy bulls we tend to buy pairs of bulls or in the last case we had three salir bulls this time we have two because we still have one of the Salir bulls. So we have one, but they're all larger framed black bulls that should give us growth towards a terminal line. That's okay. what all of our bulls look like right now. If we end up with cows, heifers that keep coming in bigger and bigger, we'll take a year or two and we'll breed everything to like Hereford. Right. And frame back, back down. frame back down our, our group. And so, but we will never choose to put in a big terminal bull and a small frame bull at the same time intentionally in the same group. Okay, so you keep your heifers separated off from So it. our heifers are always going to breed separate. Um and if we needed to breed something in a genetic line, we wouldn't put them in that main. We would separate out for instance, we have we do have some pure-blooded Salir animals. That's just the basis of the herd and so if we wanted to really breed Salir to Salir, we would pull them out into a separate breeding group. And right. we'd leave the two other bulls, terminal bulls, in with. Huh. Okay. So we are intentional about trying to keep the same type of growth and genetic potential. Uh, but we aren't worried about which bull is the father. Okay. So when it comes time to weaning, you're not concerned like, okay, this one, you know, how it performed the cat is, it's really just they should be performing similarly genetically or similarly, similar performance. Yep. And so... As Colin. long as we can get growth that we think is sort of expected across all of them, like the a lot of times if we were buying, we'd buy half brothers or Sibling. siblings of some form or fashion that yeah. and ones that are framed the same had similar if if we're buying and we do buy usually ones with an EPD on them, we'll buy ones that should have similar weaning weights, birth weights. So we so we see that we have sort of a similar trend. So then all that performance is kind of on the cow, the calf performance. Exactly. So we're really evaluating the cow independent of the bull okay um it's not perfect there's no perfect solution <laughs> to be fair we we've discussed yeah. this before that epds in and of themselves are sort of a work in progress until data comes in on an animal but hopefully we are 
choosing animals that at least give us similar and work for your herd and match what we're trying to do with the herd at that point. Yeah, we're we're a little different in the fact that we use the AI. Um, we try to, you know, a lot of times what we try to do with the AI was we'll have several different bulls in the tank. So we'll maybe have, I want to say, thirty plus bulls in the tank, and so we're trying to decide from each of those. Who do we, who's going to match this one's genetic, genetically? So we have to make it sure they're going to be different. We have to make sure that they're going to be like hot. We're looking for some high growth, but also that low birth weight potentially. So we want them to calve easily. Uh, on some of the cows, we will go up to a little higher birth weight, maybe 3.5 or uh, 4, just because we know they can handle it. Yeah. Um, and and we're, but, but for those, we're looking for high performance. And we've just started actually using this past fall and probably even this year, this spring, sex semen. So there's a couple, I want a heifer out of a couple of these. And so I'm going to use sex semen to try to get that heifer out of, out of some of these. And how much of a premium are you paying when you're purchasing semen to get it sexed? Uh, say maybe a 20% premium or, you know, you're definitely going to be paying more to get that. Um, look at my numbers again, but a lot of the semen we try to get at, uh, some of the semen we try to get some lower cost when at sales, so we go to some of these sales they have and try to get the semen at the sale so it's you know, sometimes you can purchase them a little cheaper uh, more cost effectively and then <laughs> who doesn't love a cost effective purchase <laughs> in this market we need all of them that we can get and, and then uh you know we'll go through the, the various ai so, like ai select sires abs you know all the different genetics um we'll go through and, and select which one of the bulls and we're not specific to any one but we try to pick up which bull is going to work for us and then that cow or mm -hmm. several cows. And do you have like, this is just a curiosity thing, but like where you have cows that you have bred now numerous times, have you ever said like, man, this one really did good on this type of semen. I'm going to go and rebreed to the same bull over and over again because she does so good. There, there were a couple, if I had some big framey cows, I could take some fullback or some Sakahachi and every time it could be like I could, you know, like lightning strikes. I could get a, a, a amazing high growth calf that was muscular. And so there are some you figure out, um, you know, which what works for them, and they can just knock it out every time. There's been a couple where I've had a, a cow. She had a heifer every year, and I guess she bred her to tombstone one year, produced the most amazing calf. I bred her to tombstone the next three years. I couldn't get that same calf. So yeah. it it just really sometimes depends on the cow and the bull, but. Uh, you know, we try to see what works with each one. And sometimes we do find that one that works and we just keep with it. Yeah. I'm just always curious about that because, you know, this is probably another plus minus of, of natural services. Our bulls stay in our herd for two to three years. That's it. And then we start getting heifers that come back into our, and we have to sell bulls and, and purchase new bulls versus you because you're, because you're selecting different bulls for each cow, if you find a, a combination that's really working, it could be the same for the next seven years. And that's really in some ways very enticing. Uh, in other ways though, I think it's interesting because from a commercial standpoint, you probably are gonna get more variation in growth because you're applying a lot of different genetics into yeah, we, we do see a fair amount of genetics and some of that is just getting them bred. You know, we try to synchronize, but we, we try to put the heifers in a little earlier, but sometimes they don't quite take that first time. And I think, you know, the we, we try to also catch them in heat, you know, that second time. So we synchronize with the first time. We know when they should come in heat the second time. But, you know, I, we, we try our best. to. But the bull's got more motivation to get out there and, and find it. We, we're, we're out there. Uh, nobody's jumping. You know? yeah. and, and so sometimes they can, it can be hard to see. You know, yeah. it's, it's just how it is. But most of the time they do exhibit the heat. Um, Probably also a little more difficult where you guys work off farm that not, not everyone is there all the time to observe. Right. Your window for observation is very narrow. It makes it better, it makes, better now than in the fall. Probably in the yeah. fall as you get into the darker months, it gets a, very difficult to get. It, it's, you know, you think it'd be better now, but when you start getting to doing like in past years, we're doing hay, we're doing this. It's hard to, you know, if you're out there cutting hay all day. And then you come in like, all right, I think you're good. Or nobody, I don't see anything. Or, you know, and sometimes in the winter, it's easy to see that where they got the mud on the side. You can say, you kind of know okay. what to look for. It, it's each season has a catch 22, I think. Right. 
That makes sense. It's actually kind of interesting. I would have assumed it was harder in the fall, but you, you make a good point that like you're exhausted at the end of a long day. They'd rather just go inside <laughs> and, and get a hot, cold drink of water than and, sit out there and watch for 30 or 40 minutes. And plus, you got to be out there bush hogging. We got to do, and there's all this, there's always other activities when it's do stuff while the sun shines. There's always stuff to do in the spring. And even in the fall, there's stuff to do, but you can kind of like, ah, it's dark now. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that excuse to sit there and look at the cows for a little while. <laughs> That's funny. So. You know, we but you know we we try to use different genetics we really like the ai we, we prefer it um and plus you take away some of that danger and the risk you know never you take that bull off the farm we do have some we keep on the farm for cleanup and whatnot uh, we don't have any this spring so it's pretty much all on us but uh we try to integrate because we're a purebred operation integrate that new genetics and i've even thought about Throwing a little uh, short horn or something else in there, just because I always like having one odd, one or two oddballs commercials. We do. We always have oddballs. The one thing I will say is that if you choose a bull, at least for you guys, where you have it, you choose something that has some pretty interesting genetics. It's very obvious when the calf comes out yeah. <laughs> that it's not part of. Uh, and for us, we use we use a short horn as our, our bull for our heifers. It's very obvious when we're getting calves out of the short horn versus when we're getting calves out of our big terminal black bulls. We yeah, get very clear differentiation in both yeah. color and size of those calves. And sometimes those little short horns, you know, they throw out, uh, we have another short, we have one short horn cow for the longest time and you got those little blue calves and they grow well and they do, the cows do well. So, you know, I've, I've been fairly happy with those. Yeah, we ha we haven't had any problems with any of the calves out of the short shorthorn's been a little feisty, as I said, obstinate this <laughs> this season. That might be his last, but he's had a couple good years. Uh, and, and at this point, we might we rarely keep a lot of heifers out of heifers just because they're not very well proven, unless we know that we really liked the mother of the heifer, and the heifer has a calf that's growing well. Sometimes then we will actually keep it, but it's fairly unusual on our farm. A heifer out of a heifer unless we have really strong ties to that kernel genetic right and we do keep um because whichever ones we you know we had a couple of show calves last year and then we had heifers out of heifers and so she did well because we doing the high growth ones so we we try to there's it, it depends for us it really depends on the genetics the performance of the calf and then uh they might get some additional if they were a show calf they get a little additional special treatment but generally, uh, we try to see where the genetics are, and we, we look at their genetics and their EPDs before prior to making the tax decision. So I think, you know, I think that that makes sense. I think that people have different preferences. I think there's value in AI. I often am interested in trying it, and yet at the same time, it's hard to see how it would fit into my operation. Uh, and probably for you, going straight over to a completely natural service wouldn't make sense on your operation either. I mean, it would save us a little bit of labor. I mean, but we'd have to then take care of those bulls and set, keep a separate lot and really just do a little more management, uh, which isn't impossible. We do keep some there on the farm anyway, but uh, it would just, just be, just, it'll be just another group to manage. And so I just add a little difficulty, but not, nothing that would be impossible. We kind of prefer if we're trying to sell Angus. We got to have the genetics. And so people want AI bread. That's sure. what they want. Well, and I think you get more. One of the things, you know, that we, we talk a lot about is how much data. Yeah. And, and when you buy semen, you get a lot of data because those bulls get a lot of data. Yes. A lot of people enter information. The EPDs are stronger. Or they're more precise than they would otherwise be, I think, if we correct terminology. Right. Um, you know, we look at an EPD viable, but we also are looking at the animal from a frame and a yep. body composition because that's probably what we're going to get out if we get calves that look. So we want them to look like not just a phenotype, not yeah. just say the same thing on paper. <clears throat> we also want them to look the same because in a lot of cases, that's what we're going to. And, you know, the other thing we have done uh, this past I mean, this past fall, we had a bull, um, had some decent genetics, had him, uh, had him genetically tested. And so we came back, and then his EPDs actually improved. It improved the accuracy, helps improve the accuracy of the EPDs. And so he came back, and he was really, he was in the top, like, 3% for his dollar W. So his weaning weight, his weaning weight efficiency for growth. 
Very good. And so that's definitely for us getting that information. It really helped push the sales. Like having that information helped push the sale of this bull saying, go find a better bull. Yeah. Like from a weaning weight standpoint, he's in the top 3%. Check any sale. Got to beat. Yeah. So that was something we could say. And that's really helped to get him sold out, get him out the door. So it does make a difference in my, my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of value, especially on seed stock operations to really having that data. Um, and you get much better data by using a, I mean, I think that's just the nature of that style of breeding and the amount of data coming, the strength of the data going out is also a lot better, which is valuable for anyone. So that's, I think, pretty much, I think, our take on natural service and AI. I think that's probably a good stopping point for today. Yeah. We'll um, we'll do a little bit about what's happening on the farm in the next week, and then end for the day. All right, so uh, what's happening today, or this this upcoming week, is going to try to cut a little more hay. Got some rainy weather ahead, but uh, once we get past that, that la hopefully getting that last cutting up, and then uh, probably just doing some more little repairs and maintenance, just keeping everything running the way it should be. How about yourself, Morgan? Yep, we have hay also on the agenda. It looks like we're going to get rain basically into the weekend, and then it's going to maybe dry out next week. Possibly Sunday. I don't know. Hopefully we get a good long dry window. If we do, that will absolutely get us through our final cutting of hay for this first cutting season, which is good. Our goal is always to have first cutting completely in by July 1, Yep. but ideally earlier than that. I think realistically, if we had it in in the next week, we would be doing extremely well on a, on a normal timeline for us. It's It's unusual to have. We've had a couple really good windows this year. Probably one more window than we typically would see at this point of year. So that's hopefully that comes through next week. If it doesn't, then we'll be holding off until we see it. We're almost caught up on bush hogging. We've got about two more fields that really need to be bush hogged. Um, all of our vaccinations are done, everything like that is done. We have a couple groups of cattle need to move for rotational purposes. Um, and aside from that, we have some maintenance stuff, but the larger maintenance things that I talked about at the beginning of the podcast are not really on our plate. They're they're big enough repairs that they're going to get sent out. The truck will get done in house, but the the tractor will. Be. Right. That's our plan. Maybe we we're going to talk about summer annuals. That was our agenda for next week. Yep. Um, and we were planning to do some summer annual work. Uh. But the tractor <laughs> typically <laughs> plan summer annuals with is the one that is now down. So we'll have a discussion next week about summer annuals and how we utilize them on the farm. Uh, but that's probably not on the agenda for this week, despite <laughs> our goal of that being on the agenda this week. So that's what's happening on the farm and how the weeks are progressing right now. Yeah, we, we do what we can. We that's do. All we can. That's all we, you know, we do what we can and. Hope for the best and plan, you know, just have to deal with, roll with the punches. So well, it's a rolling with the punches week at our, <laughs> at our farm. So, all right. Thank uh, you guys. Thank you all. Take care. Have You Heard is a production of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, along with the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Discover what's wildly possible at ca.uky.edu.